No. Good morning, everyone, <laughs> and welcome to University Unitarian Church. My name is John Luopa. I'm one of the ministers here and happy to greet you this morning. Today is Sunday, November 7th, our fall music Sunday, and you are in for an extraordinary uh, hour uh, before you. Glad that you're here. Glad also to welcome those who are worshiping with us this morning on the live stream. Just a reminder that as we are in the building that we remain masked and, uh, and that we uh, do not sing or hum with the hymns yet, unfortunately. Every week I hear more and more from everyone about how annoying that is, I agree. But uh, we need to do it for safety reasons and as soon as that can be lifted, of course, we will do that. Anyone interested in learning more about this church or Unitarian Universalism is invited uh, to an information session. We have them every week after each uh, service downstairs in the Dix room. And this coming Wednesday night is our monthly Vespers service, which will be offered both here on site in Nathan Johnson Hall and through Zoom. And the theme for this service will be uh, abundance and scarcity. These are the announcements that I have this morning. Friends, let us begin the service with our prelude. Let us enter into the fellowship of this morning with heart and mind and spirit. May our hearts be opened with sensitivity to the joys and sorrows, the hopes and burdens of those who sit beside us. May our minds be enlarged to understand the many languages we speak as we struggle to give voice to the wisdom that resides in each of us. May our spirits be attuned to the deepest chords of reality as we seek to center ourselves in communion with the mystery of being. As we open ourselves to this hour of worship, may our souls find peace and may the blessings of love be present with us in our togetherness. I invite you to stand as you are able or remain seated as we listen to the doxology and the opening hymn.
Today is one of our special music Sundays. We customarily have them twice a year, in the fall, in November, and in the spring in May. And of course, given the fact that we've been off-site for so long and back in and back out and pandemic, uh, the program has not been as, as enormous as it has been in years past, if you've followed us. But we are really delighted this morning to uh, share with you the gift of these, these musicians. All that we collect this morning will go in support of the music program uh, here at UUC. And you may do so either online or text or uh, as the ushers stand by the doors as we end the service this morning. And now I invite you to join me in saying the words we say each week. This church is a community of ourselves. Its energy and resources are our energy and resources. Its wealth is what we share. When we contribute to the life of this community, we affirm our lives within it. In commemoration of Veterans Day this week, all of our music this morning has an arc of the internal consternations and struggles of a soldier from fear and trepidation to acceptance and, and maybe even relief, particularly through the lens of one such soldier who I'll tell you a little bit more about this morning. But the piece we just heard by uh, Hugo Wolf speaks of uh, soldiers wondering whether or not those back home know that he, or we would say he or she or they, are loved. And was there time? And will there be time while I get home to tell them what I don't think I really did adequately before? But the piece we are about to hear is the longest of the four pieces this morning and represents two out of eight movements uh, of a composition written by Olivier Mercien. Mercien was born in 1908 in France, and at the age of 31 in 1939, he was drafted uh, and called into active duty in the French army. After the Germans invaded France in May of 1940, he and many other soldiers were captured and sent first to a makeshift camp in a field uh, in near Nancy, France, and later he was transferred uh, to a prisoner of war camp in Gerlitz, which is then in Germany but now in Poland. Conditions in the camp were extremely harsh, and 50,000 French and Belgian prisoners were literally jammed into barracks built to hold at most 15,000 people. The prisoners were underfed and unprotected from the brutally harsh, cold weather of winter. And in this place, Messier wrote one of the greatest chamber music compositions of the 20th century, the Quartet for the End of Time, Upon arriving in the camp, he was stripped naked, but clung tenaciously to a satchel of musical manuscripts that served as his consolation during his imprisonment. And because the Germans thought he posed no physical threat to them, they allowed him to keep this little bag of scores. And since many Germans still loved music, and one guard in particular, Karl Albert Brühl, did. They gave him pencils and paper so that he could compose and an empty barrack in which to do so. And that alone seems to have defied all logistical as well as emotional and spiritual odds. He started to compose music that referenced passages from earlier compositions of his. And the two movements that we are going to hear, uh, number five and number eight, 
uh, are among those recasted pieces of music. He called them songs of praise, something to hold in mind as we listen to them. He was given access to a piano and rehearsals were later held in the latrine. He wrote music for the only instruments available to him in the camp and the only musicians available to him in the camp, a piano, a clarinet, a cello, and a violin. And while Messian wrote all of the notes, the piece could not have been written without the collaboration of the three other excellent musicians, clarinetist, violist, and cellist, and the German guard, Brühl, who helped with paper and pencil. The title of the piece, Quartet for the End of Time, refers to a passage in the book of Revelation, the last book in the New Testament, a book that depicts what is going to happen at the end of the world, wherein the angel announces, quote, there will be no more time, close quote. For Messiaen, the end of time meant an escape from history, which as he was living it at the moment was severe, harsh, and brutal, and seemingly hopeless, and a leap into an invisible or expected paradise. Alex Ross, who wrote for The New Yorker, said, quote, this is the music of one who expects paradise, not only in a single awesome hereafter, but also in the happenstance epiphanies of daily life. The first performance of all eight sections of the quartet was held on January the 15th in 1941 in the camp attended by hundreds, little over 500 prisoners and German soldiers. And the cellist who played in the piece, Etienne Pasquier, described it this way, quote, everyone listened reverently with an almost religious respect, including those who perhaps were hearing chamber music for the first time. It was miraculous. These people who had never before heard such music remained silent. These people who were completely musically ignorant sensed that this was something exceptional. They sat perfectly still in awe and not one person stirred. No doubt these people reassumed their original personalities afterward, but there they were subject to a miracle, the miracle of the performance of this music." Close quote. Messiaen was in the prisoner of war camp for a total of nine months. The very same guard who had supplied him with pencils and paper, Carl Brill, also helped him return to France by forging documents for him. And a few years later, after the war ended, Brill went to visit Messiaen in Paris, but Messiaen refused to open his door. W why, we know not. When he realized his mistake, he sent a message to Brühl, but Brühl never received it because he was run over by a car upon leaving Messiaen's residence. After reading this, I was stunned by the pathos of this story. How enormously powerful are the contingencies of our lives for in them are sources of tremendous sadness and almost inexpressible joy, such that even in the darkest of times, even in the myriad ways we find ourselves imprisoned, beauty can prevail. And so what can we do with our lives? What do we do with the fact that we too are also prisoners in some ways of things that hold us back. Of his own situation, Messiaen said, my faith is the grand drama of my life. 
I am a believer, so I sing words of God to those who have no faith, and I give bird songs to those who dwell in cities and have never heard them, and make rhythms for those who know only military marches and jazz, and paint colors for those who see none." Close quote. Messiaen was a devout Roman Catholic for more than 61 years, an organist in the city of Paris, a prolific composer, but never lost his faith despite the horrors of the war. The clarinet in earlier movements of this piece play bird songs. That's what he was referencing there. And making rhythms for those who only know certain kinds of music and painting colors, he claimed to see color when he heard music and when he composed music. A truly remarkable individual and story and testament to the enduring power and resilience of the human spirit. The last piece we will hear today is an aria from Cantata 58 of Johann Sebastian Bach. The cantata was written for the Sunday that falls on rare occasions between New Year's Day and Epiphany. The prescribed Bible reading for the day comes from the first letter of Peter, which talks about the suffering of Christians. The whole cantata is about how we make sense of human suffering. And the two voices in the cantata, a soprano and a bass, represent a dialogue between the human soul, the soprano, and the bass, Jesus of Nazareth. The English translation of the words you will hear are, I am cheerful in my sorrow. Since God is my reassurance, I have a sure letter and seal, and this is the strong bolt that hell itself does not break. I would not be presumptuous enough to assume that most of us in this room have that kind of a faith in a God many have abandoned. But if you take the word symbolically, I think it represents exactly what Messiaen was doing in the quartet. Even amidst darkness and the most horrendous of circumstances, beauty can prevail. Beauty does prevail. Love does prevail. The prayer this morning was written by Vivian Pomeroy, <coughs> who was a British socialist and congregationalist minister before he emigrated to the United States in the early 1920s, where he became a Unitarian minister in Milton, Massachusetts. He was also the chaplain to Milton Academy, also in the same town. He was a prolific uh, writer, and I have used uh, words of his as a benediction many, many Sundays. Let us take much of love into all the struggles of life, etc. And he had a number of collections of prayers uh, printed, and this prayer is from one of, one of those collections. It was written during the Second World War for a service at Melton Academy, remembering uh, students and faculty who had died in the Second World War. The title of the prayer, however, is somewhat unusual. It's a Latin inscription, uh, Dulce et decorum est pro patria mori, which was written actually long, long ago by the Latin poet Horace in his collection called the Odes back in the first century. Rome had one of the greatest armies in the world, and strength and honor was its watchword. 
and it was considered honorable to die in the service uh, of the army for one's country. But this particular inscription was used as a, as a recruiting tool in the First World War in Britain uh, to enlist young men to join uh, the British war effort and to go to the front. One of those soldiers who went was Wilfred Owen, who later with Siegfried Sassoon became the two great war poets of the First World War. Wilfred Owen considered this uh, sentence a lie. He actually called it the big lie, B capital B capital L, because he claimed if anyone saw anyone who died from chlorine gas poisoning, it was the most horrendous experience possible. And how honorable could it be to die for one's country? Pomeroy took this inscription and wrote his own prayer for it, uh, for his own school, and this is what he said. O God of the love eternal, who stands within the dark mystery and yet stirs and cries in the cradle of these human hearts of ours. Behold us now, praising you for life, even now when we are all grave and sorry, still blessing you for life, still thinking greatly, thankfully of life, not thinking of it meanly or fearfully, but greatly, nobly, proudly. For the sake of these ones we are silently naming, who shared the spirit of this school and served their country and their world even unto death. For in this our prayer, O Lord of all being, we would be lifted up by the comfort and the truth that death is only the little thing and life the great thing, and that for these the young, brave, eager hearts and minds Life was the great thing, life with its search, its striving, its beauty, and its joy. And nothing can take away what they had and what others had in them, and nothing can shame it now. Not death, nor the cruel misjanges of life can ever take it away. Let the Spirit's love be as a rose ever blooming, coming out of the darkness, as our sign to carry on as much of their purposes as we can. Thus in our lives, may those, with all those we have loved and will love, still live on to our consolation and courage, to the welfare of this dear land and of this dear earth. So may our fleeting days be made richer which from the things which nothing can take from us things of honor and integrity, of devotion, of duty done, and peace, peace at the last. So may it be, amen. Our closing hymn this morning is hymn number 159, This Is My Song.
is of Barrows Dunham, whose father was a Presbyterian min minister, and he taught at Temple University in Philadelphia for many years before being blackballed as a communist sympathizer, after which it took him more than 20 years to find another academic post. This is the final paragraph in one of his books. Now, therefore, since the struggle deepens, since evil abides and good does not yet prosper, let us gather what strength we have, what courage and what valor, that our small victories may end in triumph and the world awaited be the world attained. So may it be. Amen. <laughs>